Hey everybody, thanks for joining. Uh, this is Mike Berkmeyer from Whipstitch Capital. I um, want to thank Greg, Wank, and all the staff at Anshin who really organized all of this uh, today. So um, we are going to do a, a brief presentation uh, that's only about five, 10 minutes. We're going to see how fast Nick McCoy, Nick, Nick McCoy can talk. Uh, but he's got some great data that we just actually ran this morning on kind of a lot of the, the categories in the food and beverage space and, and personal care and others, the CPG space really that have um, kind of what's happened post COVID. And then we're gonna have a panel conversation here. And for those of you that have seen it before, we've done a panel very similar to this at Expo West. And obviously that did not happen. It's been, um, you know, kind of a crazy few months. It's it amazing here, it's mid July. And um, I don't know if you can tell, you, you know, welcome to my house here. And, Portland, Maine, but I am sweating to death. It is so hot here. Um, but just a couple little housekeeping that we'll start off. So just uh, first of all, thank you for everyone for joining today. We're going to kick off the panel presentation here in a minute. Um, and it looks like everyone's done it, but please keep your video hidden and yourself muted for the panel discussion. But we do encourage you to ask questions and you can use the chat function for that. And I'll be monitoring the, the chat function for your questions and we'll try to get to those. Um, but following the conclusion of the panel, what we're gonna try to do is have that go um, for about an hour or so, about till about 5 p.m. Eastern time. Then we're gonna break into uh, different networking rooms and we're gonna have uh, about 12 to 15 minutes in one room. We'll come back, everyone will come back together and then we're gonna have a second networking too. Um, but at this time, I want to introduce the panel, then we'll get going. Uh, we have Greg Wank, who is the CPA you want to know from Anshin, is, uh, really great in the, the CPG space, worked with him many times. Josh Wand, whenever you're looking for some talent and for your team, he's the guy to talk to over at Force Brands. Nick Gianuzzi, everyone needs a little legal help here and there and really the guy in the industry. Um, and, you know, we've worked with everybody here for a long time and, and really think very highly of, of everyone. We also have Bill Moses on, on the panel too as an entrepreneur. I don't see Bill at the moment. He was here <laughs> earlier, but he has disappeared into the ether. Uh, but the, fa the founder of Kavita, oh, here's Bill. Um, the founder of Kavita and, and built that business. We, we worked with Bill, had the pleasure of working with Bill and selling and raising the money and then selling Kavita to PepsiCo and then working him with as well for the company that will be my networking beverage, Flying Embers. And uh, recently I just announced a transaction there. So with that, I'm gonna first turn it over to Nick, who's got some great data uh, that we pulled from Spins, really kind of just kind of set the stage of what's been happening in the industry in various segments over the past four or five months or so. All right, thanks Mike. Um, there's been a lot of discussion over time here about kind of what's COVID doing um, to, and hang on here, there we go, trying to advance my slides. What's COVID been doing? What are the effects of it? And I think, you know, as we've gone through this, this unusual time, month by month, um, you know, things have been evolving and data has been stabilizing. So um, we've been running data on a regular basis and I figured it was time to do some digging around at you know, what's kind of the latest in trends and what does that mean at a high level for everybody? So starting off here, um, we took a look at basically all of the categories within SPINS and looked at who are or which categories are the biggest gainers. And this was actually kind of hard to do because every subcategory has its own growth trend that's underlying it or, you know, or, or its own receding trend or declining trend. And we had to factor that out. And we also had to look at you know, those categories that have just gotten a very big lift from COVID. Um, and to net all that out, what we did is we looked at the two dollar growth numbers and took the minimum of it and then sorted the entire universe that way. So that's what you see here as our attempt to try to bring that out. And the long and short of it is, is people are indulging in alcohol and sweets, keeping their freezers full and they're growing sterile. It's pretty much as simple as that. Um, Here's what's interesting when we flip it and we look at the decliners, and this was a little more difficult to do that with, so we just looked at what's declined since February. Surprisingly, cold and flu products were the biggest decliners, which they should be when you think about the seasonal impact, but they probably shouldn't be with COVID, but they were. Um, 
A lot of other categories, as you see here, are real seasonal decliners. But the one thing that is, I think, the takeaway from this is the on-the-go items, such as gums and mints and candy, and bars is actually about five below this on this list. That's another category a lot of people have been talking about. These on-the-go items that people take with them when they're traveling, flying on planes, um, the, the consumption is down quite a bit. Um, the next way we sliced the data was to look at pantry loaders. And this was actually difficult too, but what we did is we took the growth from February to April, and then we subtracted the growth from February to June. So which items basically had the biggest growth in the middle of the pandemic, um, but actually didn't continue to grow throughout it. And so when we sorted all this out, as you take a look at it, flour, um, ingredients, things that are in the made from scratch area around the home, you know, for cooking, baking, that kind of thing, are all here. Um, that's pretty much the majority, and then butter and eggs. And I think that was just because butter and eggs seem to be pretty short in the grocery store, and I think they don't take up too much space in the fridge, so people bought a lot of them. And then there's the opposite of the pantry loaders, which is what was not impacted. And this is pretty predictable. Think things that are large in size. So you're going through the grocery store, you're going once a week, you've got a very full shopping cart. I know I spilled a few things out of mine in the grocery store back in March and April. And you just can't fit two big things of laundry detergent in there, so you don't. So it's laundry, it's large personal care things, things that get used over multiple months and weren't a concern about running out. And then another takeaway here is how does that percolate into categories? Well, things that are large in a category, like puff snacks, which also take up a lot of space, is a good example. And then also perishables like yogurt and probiotics that you kind of have to buy every week or you know, every couple weeks. So what else is going on? Well, when we actually look at the three channels, natural enhanced, ULO, which is conventional grocery plus club plus mass and drug, and convenience, and we look at what happened over month to month, you can see February's black going month by month over to the kind of light green on the right, which is the July data. Natural and Mulo basically had a pantry loading phase and then they, they kind of trickled down and there's about a 10% plus, a little bit more than 10% permanent lift, we'll call it, or at least sustained lift, which is really you know, restaurant dollars that have been traded into retail. If you, look at restaurant, um, if you look at restaurant food, a restaurant calorie costs about twice as much as a retail calorie. So if there's 10% increase in retail, it's because about 20% of restaurant has been, or you know, food service has been traded away. Um, and then convenience, as people started to get out of shelter at home, that started going up, uh, as you can see, really in kind of the May, June, July period. So we had to take a deeper look into convenience to see what was being bought there, just because it stood out so much. And no surprise, it's beverages, alcohol, um, and frozen desserts. Um, so what are conventional consumers doing right now? At first, they bought immunity products. There was a lot of data on that. But right now, when we boil down the spins universes, it appears that con conventional consumers are starting to really over-index better for your products. You know, all along here, we were thinking that COVID is going to have a rising tide where consumers are going to be thinking wellness. And what can I eat and take better care of myself so that I can build a better immune system to fight off this virus? The SPINS universe is TPL, is 100% of everything there. HWY is the better for you universe, which is about 30%, it's actually kind of high 20s. And NPI is the purest of the better for you, call it about 9%, it's about a third of HWI, and that's kind of the, the cleanest of the clean. So you can see in March, the knee-jerk reaction was a big drive into NPI purchases, which was immunity products and things like that. And that March period, by the way, spans from the middle of February to mid-March. And then after that, there's basically HWI, which is the kind of better for you, call it more nutrient dense foods, things that are a, a small trade up in price compared to the conventional product, significantly over indexes both NPI and TPL. So that tells me that the mass consumer, the conventional consumer, the one that has maybe not bought that much in this universe before is starting to migrate this way. And that's a really great rising tide for companies in our sector. Um, one other concern that continues to come up is we have a lot of job losses, we're in a recession, what's going to happen going forward here, and are people going to be, you know, pinching pennies and saving dollars? So one thing that we've been tracking here is what's going on with private label as a percentage of total grocery. And as you can see here, over the first three, three months, there was a very insignificant change in private label, 19.9% .9 of the total, 19.8, 19.9. 
and then starting in, in May and really accelerating in June, private label is declining. So people are becoming more and more brand loyal as they've come out of pantry loading and as they've moved more and more into wellness. Another great sign for our branded products in our industry. Um, and, and by the way, given the job losses have increased, a lot of people are longer out of work, a sign that people are buying better for you products because they're buying them for health and not because they have excess dollars. Um, this is a slide that we've, we've had before, but it just shows a very long-term picture of this to illustrate the point again. If you look at the dark bars, that's the growth in natural products, and the gray bars are conventional grocery. On the bottom, we were trying to figure out why is the conventional grocery all over the place and the natural steady. The only thing we could find that correlated it was uh, U.S. household income growth. And when you look at income growth, it was actually inversely correlated to the movements in conventional grocery. In other words, if income went down, conventional grocery went up and vice versa. The only theory I have in that is restaurant dollars were basically where that money would go. So if somebody was making more money, they were going to our restaurants and buying less conventional grocery. But what's interesting here is the natural product stays very, very level. There's a little dip in 19, which was just because the rate of growth in our industry slowed just a little bit. But this also illustrates that as personal income moves around, people are not skimping on natural products. People are moving into this and you can see the growth, this is growth rate uh, or growth dollars. The growth dollars of natural products continues to go up at a, at a very steady rate and this says basically that people are doing it because they want to buy wellness products for their health and not because of their budget. And now, Mike, I'm going to pass it back to you and not read our disclaimer. Sorry, Nick. Okay. Great. Thanks, Nick. So I'm going to go through and ask all of the, the panelists to introduce themselves in a second and uh, you know, ask some kind of questions and, and opening comments. But first, Nick, when you looked at the data and, and ran this today, obviously, you know, we primarily raise capital for companies and sell companies, but what jumped out at you the most and, you know, that kind of has relevance and people should be thinking about, or it was, you know, super interesting. I, I really think the, the rising tide of the conventional consumer moving toward nutrient density and better for you products is, is really, really important. One of the main reasons of that is if you look over the years, it's been very, very difficult to market nutrient density. You know, you've got about two minutes, two seconds on a conventional store shelf for somebody to see your product and make a decision to buy it. So they're not going to pick it up. They're not going to read a label. If you're in Whole Foods, they might. You have more time. But the fact that people are paying more attention to that, or at least the data is suggesting that, means that if you've got a nutrient-dense product, you, you don't have to go and spend tr as tremendous amounts of money to educate a customer on, you know, that you've got more of four different minerals and three different vitamins than a conventional counterpart or a counterpart made from a less sustainable supply chain. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, and one of the things that we always see too, you know, you've had this huge COVID bump for a lot of the categories and it's so interesting. It's always important for companies to be in the data and understand the data. And then if you think about your own business and how you're growing and you might be seeing incredible growth, but it's, you know, some of the categories you showed there showed 80% plus growth and 50% plus growth. If you're not growing faster than the category, someone else is actually taking share from you. So you actually may not be quite growing like you think you are. So it's really important to, to understand the data and, and probably and benchmark yourself against the category. Um, Greg Wank, um, gonna ask you, <laughs> this is great. This is, I'm treating this like a real panel. You guys don't know when I'm gonna call on you. You don't know what I'm gonna ask you. This is fantastic. I'm in control here. No one can ask me anything. Greg, um, you're seeing a lot of balance sheets. You're seeing a lot of P&Ls over the past four or five months, you know, relative to where companies were ahead of the, the pandemic. What are you seeing? What are you hearing from your clients? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, you know, 2020 was always going to be an interesting year. I think a year of of shaking out certain things in the industry, and I think COVID kind of accelerated everything in, in that regard. Um, what we're seeing in our client base is, for the most part, particularly those that weren't heavily dependent on food service and travel, uh, incredible bumps and growth in their business far, far out doing their projections. Um, we're seeing P and L's with black ink, uh, on, from several companies that didn't expect that to be quite ready yet in 2020. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, fresh sources of capital coming from these better results. 
So they might have come into this year thinking they needed to raise significant amount of dollars by a certain time, and now they can push that back and be a little more strategic about it and not hopefully as, as needy and desperate about it because they have positive results and stronger results. Uh, so the conversations with those, with those clients have been more about, you know, what do I do with this new source of capital? What do I do now that I'm cash flow positive or I'm, I'm going to be cash flow positive this year? What does that mean to me and my team? And what is the future of my business through this lens? You know, so we've been advising clients to just throw away their original 2020 budgets for the second half of this year and start over. Uh, we got to take a fresh look at the business, look almost as, at second half of 2020 and the first half of 21 as a new fiscal year for you uh, and see what that looks like and, and model out your cash flow and, and approach things that way. How are people feeling about their ability to properly and you know as accurately as possible forecast the rest of 2020? Do they feel like they're settling into understanding this new reality? Yeah, I, well, certainly as I think everyone's getting smarter as weeks go by, right? I mean, that was a really hard conversation when we started talking to clients back in March and April about, you know, DEF CON 5 planning. You know, we don't know what's going to be. The world might be ending. We need to conserve cash. Um, and then as the data came in and the results came in and they realized this wasn't actually a negative for their business potentially, it might have caused a lot of stress for sure, but actually has been a positive for their business. They've gotten a bump. Um, they, they've gotten more knowledgeable and, and they've been pleasantly surprised, I think, about the receptiveness to opening new channels of distribution to get launching new products even. Mm -hmm. Where back in March and April, they were saying, I guess anything I was going to launch this year, I can forget about. Uh, and that's not, that's proving not to be the case. Thanks, Josh. Um, Greg's talking about improved balance sheets for a lot of companies. That every, you know, a lot of what we saw, we were talking the other day ahead of this, people were, were obviously and, and rightfully scared when the pandemic started and, there, and you know, people had a lot of you know, rightful reasons to be scared now too. But, you know, with better balance sheets, with this new reality, with so much more of the consumer's dollar being spent on, you know, food, beverage, products at home, consumed at home, what are you seeing with companies in terms of hiring, you know, types of positions, categories, you know, you, you kind of get the early read because you're, you're talking to some, you have so many clients, you know, in the industry well, where are the needs and what's being filled now? Where are things headed? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think we probably experienced a, a lot of similar um, feedback as you guys did, you know, at the beginning in late March, early April, where like everyone just stopped. They didn't know if the world was going to continue. Like it was, it was silence and everyone had to kind of resituate and figure out where they were going to work remotely. And then what, what a lot of these companies soon realized, the ones that had healthy balance sheets or that had a competitive advantage is, listen, we have a business. The business is actually working. We have to move forward, but we need to scrap our original plans and scrap our forecast and figure out how to reorganize and design our, our company. And so a lot of the initial plans that have been put in place for hiring strategies and headcount, it changed. But I think for the better, you saw an acceleration of D2C, you know, performance marketing, supply chains being rebuilt. <clears throat> I mean, the amount of work we are doing now to build out direct to consumer in e-com platforms for businesses is mind boggling. I mean, we've never been this busy, but a lot of the traditional roles in the field um, have, have changed and they've been reappropriated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, supply chains have been have taken a hit. So. Um, we've been working, you know, pretty intensely with a lot of organizations to look at the structure there. And one of the things that we've been seeing is like executive leadership is more valued than ever. Um, being able to navigate through these uncharted waters requires know-how and experience. And, you know, one of those things that um, we feel so lucky about is we're working kind of in this essential living space of things you eat and drink and personal care and pet and cannabis and you know, a lot of these brands are doing really well. I mean, the ones that had trouble fundraising prior, it's super high valuations, like they're not hiring because they're not getting capital. 
um, but the ones that are properly capitalized, right, is they need to deploy, but just differently. So it's really fascinating because now we're designing remote workforces and virtual workforces of the future and everyone's learning together. No one's done it. My company did it, you know, 80 people decentralized. And my other company did it. We have, you know, 18 people decentralized. And you figure out what's working and roles change. But what's really amazing is once these invisible walls are removed, um, organizations are realizing we don't need people just working in our corporate office. We don't just need to hire someone in LA or New York. We can find the best talent available. They might not be full time. They might be contingent. We can dip our toes in the water a little bit and people are available now. So I would say that it doesn't mean that, you know, um, the employment market didn't take a massive hit. It did, but now organizations that are in a healthy place are rethinking how they design their company and infrastructure. And I mean, there's, we have a lot of activity, um, but uh, you know, it's really the interesting part is how companies evolve structurally mm -hmm. in the roles that will exist. So um, Nick Gianuzzi, um, Josh touched on, or he said one thing, he said companies that had high valuations ahead of uh, the epidemic might be, I think what you said, Josh, might be having trouble raising capital. Um, and uh, one, we, we touched base the other day, and it's something that we're, we're seeing a, a definite uptick in um, in the markets in terms of strategics returning, um, you know, the, their sales have increased dramatically as well over the past few months. They're sitting on more cash than ever. Investors are out there looking for opportunities. I think at first, what we heard is that a lot of people are looking for, you know, distressed opportunities. There will be opportunities in the marketplace. I don't know that, you know, that hasn't developed as fast as I, uh, I think I'm, it may have or anticipated, but Nick, what, what are you seeing from your clients in terms of the fundraising market, the M&A market? I know that's something that you handle a lot of for your client base. Yeah, um, thanks Mike. So as we all saw on virtually every aspect of every business, March and April were a bit of a wasteland. We had, you know, we're normally closing about 200 equity financings a year for our client, which average out to be, you know, 15 or so a month. In April, I think we worked on maybe two deals as opposed to 15 or 20. Um, in May, we started getting a lot of calls from the usual suspect private equity funds saying how they had spent the last month and a half shoring up their existing portfolio companies and they were going back to work. And, and I mean, they were always working, but they were now looking outwardly uh, and they were, you know, there was a lot of those were looking for an opportunity, um, but there was also just a lot of, of funds that wanted to, you know, consistently invest in both maybe a lower market and, and what will hopefully over time turn back into a thriving market. Um, May and June got busier and went from sort of just talking about it to actually getting term sheets. And, um, you know, we're now towards the end of July and you know, we, our, um, our sort of private equity financing is, is up. It's, is it at normal level? I, I would say maybe it is. On the M&A side, uh, we were lucky to be part of the Vital Proteins uh, sale to Nestle. So that made our June very, very busy. Um, and that was very much a normal deal in the sense of valuation. Uh, it was, it was a great valuation. It was a eager buyer that wasn't talking COVID out the side of their mouth when they were talking about price and terms. And they just said, you know, this is a good company at a good time and we're a good buyer. So um, we're very, very optimistic about where the market is right now. I think that if everybody remembers that um, people who are professional investors, their job is to, is to deploy money. And there's various people within that structure that justify what they do for a living because they're able to deploy money. It doesn't mean they'll make bad investments. It doesn't mean they'll make hasty investments. And there is a, a brand new set of, you know, confusing data out there where you look at, you know, so many of these brands that are doing above budget, they, they were able to cut marketing costs. So their profitability has gone up. So to some degree, the biggest problem for some of these investors is not being too fooled by the great results for the last six months for some of the companies. For other companies, 
uh, for instance, let's say that a particular company had a strong presence at convenience. Let's say it's a beverage, and then, and so convenience got hammered because nobody was traveling. Let's yeah. say it was a bar company, or so. There's new challenges in figuring out what to pay for uh, a company in terms of valuation, and maybe which the right ones are. But what what we're seeing is I'm not exactly going to call it a boomerang or a slingshot effect yet, but we're seeing active buyers. Um, we're seeing um, private equity funds that really want to go out and, and to do deals. Uh, we've got clients that would have liked, right? If you do a, a financing every 15 financings a month, it means that there's a normal flow that people need to raise money at a certain point, right? Like, you know, some there's people on the, on the, in the call in now that know that they're going to run out of money next March. And so that's happened. So what happened to those companies that are doing well, but started running out of money in March or April or May or June. So there's a pent up demand of founders and management teams that want to go out and raise money. I think there's a pent up demand for, for good investors that want to make investments. The level where that access sort of meets, is it a slow, slightly lower valuation? Are the terms slightly more in favor of the investors? I would say perhaps. But it is not a bloodbath. And, um, and for those of you out there who have a great company but didn't get a lift from COVID, which is obviously, you know, 50% of the companies or 30 or whatever the number is, you know, the fact that, you know, you might have had your bar company and, and so your bars were, were decelerated a little bit, um, you know, that is something that you can explain. And if you have to do a financing at a little lower valuation to get to the other side, well, that's where we are. But I do think it's very positive. And I think, and I'll stop talking to you now, but what Nick McCoy said, uh, the most important thing here is that it turns out that even with a disastrous, completely, you know, left hook of COVID, which none of us had any idea was going to happen, our industry, uh, what we do, what people want, and the health trend and the better for you trend, and maybe if it's a little bit more expensive, that is something that is going to continue. It's going to continue to thrive. Money's going to follow. Retailers going to want it. Ultimately, strategics are going to want to buy these company companies. So we're in a good spot, even though there's a bit of haze and a bit of confusion at the moment. I, I would agree with what you said entirely. And, you know, we're certainly, you know, we're talking to investors and acquirers all the time. And we, you know, we have been nonstop, you know, pre-COVID and since COVID hit and definitely, you know, saw a pretty rigid M&A ban in place with all the major strategics when COVID initially hit. As you'd expect, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, Nick Giannuzzi, you actually do know a lot more than you, you, you pretend to or say, uh, to in, in terms of what the future is, because you're the one I think in uh, mid February said that my fun my son would be coming home from college after uh, spring break, and you were totally right. Yeah, he he took that that plane from <laughs> Florida and the baseball team to my house, not back to college. So, so, sorry to be know, right, Mike. You do know the future, Bill Moses. Um, so as an entrepreneur, you know you've got another company that you're building right now. You're, I know you're also involved with several others as an investor, as a board member. So you're very close, you know, to the entrepreneurial community and, and the operators and you, and you are an operator. What, what are you seeing in terms of some of the challenges, you know, some of the, maybe the newer best practices that you're seeing out there and, you know, how companies are, are overcoming and dealing with a lot of this. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, uh, Mike. So, um, so I think the first uh, challenge we had during this uh, this initial COVID hit, and still lingering a bit, well, you know, are uh, resets. So there's still a few uh, retailers out there that haven't fully caught up on resets. Resets, and that's uh, you know that's been pretty impactful on uh, uh, go-to-market strategy execution, and ultimately some of the you know some of the proof points on on some of the innovations. So I think from a from an operating uh, sales uh, uh, perspective, that's uh, I think that's going to continue as well. In um, you know, in, in states where we go back into lockdown or 
where various retailers are less um, predisposed to having um, um, doing resets, et cetera. So I think that's going to be with us for a while. Um, and then it's sort of internally we're, you know, we're challenged because we run manufacturing. We have our own uh, facility here where we do our own warehousing, our own D2C shipping, uh, our own uh, manufacturing. And we have a lot of people coming and going in our different parts of our 80,000 square foot facility. And it's really challenging. We have set policy. Um, policy is evolving. But the enforcement of policy to have consistent oversight across all divisions is something that as a uh, fast growing um, smaller company is really challenging. We're looking at a resource potentially of hiring um, to help us manage this specifically. And, um, you know, there's oftentimes I go home and I think about my day and I ran into the manufacturing uh, facility and I saw 10, 11, 12 temps that came in that were transients that didn't, uh, that don't work here. I've never seen them before. I don't know what they're touching. I don't know what they're breathing. It's really, it's really sketchy for, for me and for, and for us. And, um, and so it's one thing to be able to govern our own internal staff. And even that's a challenging given how fast we're moving and how sometimes careless we could be when you're moving fast and we're super competitive and we're trying to get something out the door. But yet on top of that, the, the amount of different sort of temps that we have coming in. Um, and all I can say is it's been one of the biggest concerns of the company outside of meeting top line and meeting our contribution margin numbers. Um, it's really one of the biggest challenges and, and, and concerns we have as a senior leadership right now. Yeah, I, I bet. Josh, what, what are you seeing companies do in terms of trying to, to deal with that from a, a staffing perspective, you know, dealing with this, this, this new reality and safety and, you know, keeping everyone healthy in manufacturing, in the office, and even remotely? It's re I mean, it's really a big challenge is, is organizations look to re-enter and phase their teams back into the workplace, whether that's, you know, manufacturing, whether that's retail, whether that's traditional office space. I mean, I don't think there's a company on the planet that's not talking about it right now um, that has employees, even if they're working remotely, how they're feeling. Um, you you, you want to be able to geo-target caseload. Um, we actually, um, because of that, in being in kind of the HR recruiting space, did a lot of listening. In my software business, Pinata, we just launched a solution that's essential basically for preparing companies to reopen their doors. It's called Heyday. Um, which stands for how are you today, but it's basically a wellness screening app for businesses to safely reopen the retail, factory, office spaces, and it basically tracks employee and visitor wellness, including temporary staff, but it's like a traffic control solution. So heyday, like it enables offices to enforce space capacity limits and new protocols for visitors and workers. And that's the whole thing is like, who's coming to my space? Because God forbid one person comes in there and there's an outbreak your facility shut down, mm. but like who was working during that shift? How many people were there? And Bill has a whole nother, it's just like who's touching what when they're there, temperature scanning, um, heat sensors. So, you know, it's real. And by the way, it's not going anywhere because companies are just now, you know, manufacturing and retail people are working, but organizations are going to start phasing back in in 2021. And even post COVID, yeah. you know, companies are going to want to know that their employees are healthy and safe. And yeah. so we're very long on this. And yeah, and we actually just stood up this week, this week it's heyday.co, H-A-Y-D-A-Y. -Y. And Bill didn't even know that really. But to this, to his point, like you got all these humans in your space, you better figure out a responsible way to manage and track them. No, so, it's, it's a big, it's a big issue. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we do have the chat function available for people to ask questions and some, some have come in. So Nick McCoy, I want to give this one to you and, um, you know, Nick Gianuzzi, I'm curious what your thoughts might be as well. But uh, we have a question on um, how do we think, you know, COVID-19, and I'll expand. I mean, they, they, the question was how is COVID-19 going to impact M&A, you know, for, uh, you know, large companies and brands over the next few years? I mean, I would posit to say things were changing before COVID-19, um, and now 
you know, there was uh, this, un, you know, I guess uncertainty, but you also have um, this, the certainty is that there is more consumption at home. It, and it has been that way now for, for several months and it, it will continue to be that way. And you certainly developed, you know, a lot of new habits, you know, uh, baking mixes were not in favor for years. Now you can't even, you know, there's no promotional spend in that category. But Nick, what, what do you, th uh, McCoy, what do you think is, uh, you know, what will happen over the next three years from what we're hearing out there? Um, great question. I think, you know, what we first saw when COVID hit was a bit of a, a knee-jerk reaction to kind of pull back. And some of that was just, you know, the, the orders that large companies were receiving for products, which were COVID pantry load products, just completely overtaxed their system and distributors too. Um, and, and then, you know, once we get through that, then, you know, there's teams that, you know, we're still over indexing. So there's teams trying to deal with managing that. Uh, as well as all the other issues of just running a big company with all the manufacturing and everything. And the thought of integrating a large brand is really scary then because, you know, there's whatever, 40 people from the field to the shelf managing different stovepipes, and you have to be able to have resource availability in, in all of that. What we're seeing now is people are, are generally, you know, getting more aggressive, you know, taking a look at things more. Um, I think at the end of the day, if you're a large public company, you need revenue growth. And if we're seeing more and more dollars going to health and wellness products, things that are emerging innovative products, and that that's where the revenue dollars are going to be growing, at the end of the day, large companies are going to want, are going to have a lot of interest in that. Um, they are set up to manage larger brands. The average size of an independent brand bought by a large strategic in the last five years has just about doubled. It's now somewhere over 100 million in revenue. So I think, you know, if the dollar base going into the companies in our sector is going up, that means the companies can get larger. And if that's where the growth is, I think the big companies are going to continue to buy. I think the long term yeah. trend is positive. Yeah, no, I'd agree. The balance sheets, the balance sheets are strong. One thing that Bill Moses said too uh, kind of relates to something we've heard. And um, you know, Bill talked about some of the companies having trouble getting new innovation on the shelves. We had one strategic tell us that you know, over the next 12 months or so, all of the internal new innovation that they were planning on doing is kind of on hold. And they're going to look externally at M&A for innovation because those companies are already moving, they're already getting shelf space. Uh, so I think that will continue as well. But Nick, Nick Gianuzzi, are you, you know, you're through your clients and, you know, through these negotiations with large strategics like Nestle with Vital Proteins, what do, what do you see happening? Well, I guess backing up, um, Mike and, and Nick, you guys both have seen the same thing because we've talked about it. The last 24 months before COVID, we saw a bit of a shift with strategics where, you know, they were less apt to buy a high growth company without EBITDA. Maybe they were less apt just generally to, to acquire. It felt like there was a bit of a chilling over the last 24 to 30 months before COVID. And um, what, I, what I think I'm seeing in, in conversations with the acquisition teams from the strategics uh, and also just trying to think through the data, um, what, what did we find out? We found out that the food and beverage companies, both big and small, ha had an opportunity to do well here. A lot of these big um, uh, uh, international food conglomerates have done well and they're sitting on cash. And um, some of them, uh, I think, are getting stronger legs and they're, they're getting more aggressive uh, and they're looking outwardly maybe more quickly than they would have done had COVID not had its effect. Um, and they're looking at this data for these young companies that maybe are a little more profitable, maybe they're profitable ahead of schedule. Maybe like, mm -hmm. like Greg Wank had said earlier, you know, there's suddenly they're, 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 these young brands are dealing with a problem they never had before, which is they're actually making money. And, and so uh, I, I, actually, I actually think, and this goes to my, my comment before about Slingshot or Boomerang, I actually think we're going to see quite a bit of activity, not only from the private equity guys doing both minority and also majority deals, but I think there's going to be quite a bit of interest in the next, I don't know, 12, 18, 24 months from the strategics, we're starting to see that. We're starting to see them put out feelers. We're starting to have some conversations. So I'm, I'm again, 
we don't know what happens next with COVID. We don't know what happens in the fall and the winter, whether, you know, we're going to go back to a late March, uh, April type, you know, fear factor where, where people start looking inwardly instead of trying to keep growing. But if absent something like that, I think we're going to have a lot of good stories about a lot of good brands selling even in 2020 and then 2021 should be a robust year. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I do have to give a shout out to Greg Wank and the engine team. And uh, I, I did this early on LinkedIn that they, they did some fantastic work with uh, our client Thayer's and this and our and represented Thayer's in the sale of L'Oreal. Um, but that, that process, you know, really kind of showed the importance of kind of having your, you know, books in order. Um, you know, because, you know, you, Anshin came in and did, did a lot of great work on, uh, you know, getting those books. You have to be, when the time comes to sell, you need to be ready to sell. Are you, Greg, what are, what are you seeing or what, what are your advice for companies that, you know, um, think about raising money or thinking about selling? And if you, if you look at, you know, companies that maybe are not your clients, but you're, or your clients, um, but I'm, I'm assuming not your clients if their books are not in order. Um, of course. You know, but, but what, what you're seeing and, you know, just your advice as companies are getting ready to sell and thinking about that in the future. Yeah, I, I think we, we've been seeing uh, a, a big trend in our business for the last, it's been going on for the last year or more on being proactive about that. I'm seeing more in, inbound activity, you know, referred to us or brands coming to us saying, look, I don't know when, I don't know how, but if there's something that's in my future that I need my house in order, you know, sooner the better. Whereas I'd say a few years ago, it was so back and they said, I'll worry about it when I have to worry about it. And I think that was already starting to change pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I think it's it's accelerating now. I mean, certainly, you know, speaking of affairs in our transaction business, um, it, it's there's been so much demand for, you know, what you would call sell side activity. You know, before you start a process, having us come in or, you know, obviously there are other firms that do it too, but no one as well as we do it. And we would come in and, and just help make sure that they are ready for that so that when you have that great opportunity to get a phone call, like Nick just mentioned from a, a strategic and you get an offer that you didn't expect and you can't refuse, you better be able to still provide. They're still going to go through full diligence. It's not like they're just going to fast track the deal, you know, particularly if it's a larger strategic, you know, your house has to be really pristine to pass those kinds of level of diligence that those big companies put you through. No, I totally agree. I'll, I'll throw this one out to the panel. Uh, it's a question that came in and uh, I've got a strong opinion on this, uh, you know, from talking to strategics too, but um, kind of looking at the, the M&A landscape and what might be happening over the next few years, you know, what, what do we think about, you know, smaller high growth companies, you know, versus, large companies and and where are strategics in in their thoughts and i'm not saying this is a test but i have the answer so <laughs> I'm, I'm curious what what else everyone says okay now i just shut everybody up <laughs> <laughs> mccoy you're up <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, hey, Mike, I, I apologize. I had something happen to my audio and I missed the last half of your question. Wow, what, a, what an excuse. What Seriously. an excuse. Okay. Um, if, does somebody anybody else want to jump in? I think nobody heard your question. I didn't, I didn't hear you. <laughs> oh, what's did my audio go? Um, <laughs> welcome to Broadband in Maine. Um, we, had, we had a question about the M&A landscape and just what's going on in, you know, with strategics right now, and then will things change? Will you look, will some M&A, some strategics be looking at smaller, higher, re, high revenue, high growth businesses as potential acquisition candidates, or will there be a certain size threshold? Do you have to be 50 million? Do you have to be a hundred million? Um, you know, will, will there be the opportunities for that, you know, 10 to $20 million business to get acquired as well. 
I can jump in. Um, so one thing I would say is that the, the question is about the strategics, but I think that part of the answer is the fact that what a strategic is is changing quickly. So I think w w one thing I mentioned the 24, 30 months before COVID and how the big strategic seemed a little bit less interested. What we're seeing more and more of, and I'm doing a couple of these deals right now, where it's not a big company buying a little company, or maybe it's a medium-sized company buying a little or, you know, somewhere between little and medium. So, you know, the, the, the $20 million revenue company just might not be interesting to General Mills because what do you do with it? Do they, do they end up ruining it because it's so small? Uh, and, of course, it doesn't move the needle. However, if um, you're a company that's doing $100 million and you want to start you know, um, going into slightly different areas or you want to start um, or you think you can create, you know, get rid of redundancies and costs by doing smart acquisitions. That's what we're seeing a lot of. And we're seeing that with some beverage companies, you know, medium sized beverage companies. We're seeing it in the um, in the snacking arena. Uh, we're seeing we're also seeing a couple of different private equity funds start to roll up brands. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we know VMG is looking to do that. And, um, you know, we saw Sonoma with, with Crave and some other things that uh, they're doing. So I think that the, the rules maybe haven't changed that if you're too small, the big strategics aren't going to look at you. But there's a lot, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And, and those opportunities are, are becoming more and more common. Uh, and now, like, you know, maybe a third of our deals are, medium-sized companies buying smaller ones and a third of our deals are private equity funds buying companies and then the last third is is maybe the strategic so in a sense more buyers are coming in the market and i think that's a really positive thing and uh, those buyers don't all necessarily look at the same thing yeah i think it's well said yeah i would uh, say mike um you know we we've seen also our clients finding you know the new channels of distribution right not not just growing their own online businesses which most of them have but also you know meal kits and and, and other type of 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 ways to get your product out there which has been higher margin business uh reducing reliance on heavy promotional spending which improves margins which the strategics love when they come in or the larger private equity funds love that you can show them that you can you know get product out and sold and in consumers hands with less promotional dollars is always a big win uh, and we're, we're seeing that as well as a result of covid yeah um hey mike one thing uh i think nick's points were really good and just to kind of take a step back if large strategics are waiting to buy growth companies when they're closer to the size brands that they like to manage which are call it 300 million and above so Instead of buying at 35 or 50 million revenue, maybe they want to buy closer to 100 if they can. Um, and you know, obviously, it gets harder and harder to grow companies, right? As a founder or a you know whatever management team, as companies get larger, there's this opportunity. There's this kind of gap in the market. And you know, Nick's point about private equity entering that is great. I think that's right. You know, we're seeing more and more SPACs. A SPAC is a special purpose acquisition corp. It's basically a public shell company whose sole purpose is to buy one company. And usually that company right now in today's market is 100 million revenue or more. And it may not have the growth story that you would need to go through a regular IPO, but you can get bought by a SPAC. And the great thing about SPACs is once they get that deal done, they're now another buyer. And we're seeing more and more of these SPACs coming into the market. And I think you know the great thing about um, our economy is where there's an opportunity and we have a fundamentally good you know, business model, which is a branded product business, and the opportunity being companies that are in that, call it 50 to whatever, $150 million range that you know, need a partner or want a partner or better off with a partner, you know, that opportunity is going to get filled. So we're seeing it filled with private equity, SPACs, medium-sized buyers. I think over the next 12 to 18 months or next year or two or whatever, we're going to see other, you know, m much more of those, but other types of buyers moving in to fill that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. We've seen the same thing. I'm, it's a new phrase I've been starting to say is your your eventual acquirer may not exist yet. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it might only be a couple months around the corner where we're doing 
some work right now with uh, you know a group of ultra high net worth families from across the globe that are kind of looking to create the the next uh, new strategic that is solely interested in the better for you space. That will be a new strategic if this mm -hmm. you know kind of plays out. Um, there's a lot of questions on direct to consumer, um, you know, coming in. And um, Bill, I know you've had some experience with this, you know, with uh, flying embers um, as well. And, you know, some of the questions are, you know, uh, how does strategic value it? But then I think, you know, plays into to Josh's uh, comment too, that there are a lot of people looking for a lot of talent in direct to consumer. Um, but Bill, I know you, you know, recently brought in some people, you know, how, how are, you know, you thinking about direct to consumer and kind of finding the right people and, and kind of, creating value for the business and, and maybe even the other businesses you're involved with. Cause you know, we all know that e com is, is incredibly important now. I mean, we think it basically what would be like four to six years from now is now because of COVID. Yeah. Right. Well, um, so, um, you know, one of the companies I was involved with had, uh, was doing about a half a million dollars on Amazon business a month alone. And, um, you know they've got they got penalized or they got re uh, they they were not considered for for all the wrong reasons to be uh, part of the essential um, sort of supply uh, so they were put uh, it was really difficult for them to to get to get uh, sales out so I know that COVID had caused some problems with uh, Amazon and how they were classifying different uh, you know different uh, products but. Um, but yeah, taking a step back, I mean, clearly um, online has uh, many different industries, especially the uh, alcohol industry, really had a 10-year advancement in direct-to-consumer um, because of COVID. And that, that comes out of AB. They did, a, they did a, a, a white paper on this, and it was really, it was really pronounced that, that all of a sudden, in a, in a very restricted uh, three-tier system in, uh, in, in Bev Alk, you, you, we really had no, no real uh, route to market. All of a sudden, give or take, 20 states have opened up overnight. And it's really created a, an opportunity to leverage what we see the real value of D2C is not only to have, um, you know, have higher margins and um, having another class of trade and channel to sell into, uh, but really to leverage if you're building brand and you're uh, launching new product lines, when you go D to C and you have an opportunity to promote that direct to consumer transaction, uh, you have a lot more money to spend to build brand. Traditionally, you go out, you do a, a digital ad, you don't have a D to C play. You really, it just goes and you hope that the impression or the click through has some value ultimately to building brand where they go and buy it at Publix or wherever it might be. Now we can actually, you know, take additional dollars, do D to C, get an initial return. So we've doubled our, our, our digital spend overnight because of COVID, because now we have an additional class of trade we're spending on, which we're getting a return on above and beyond what we have traditionally with our digital spend to build brands. So it's been a real bonanza for us, for small companies and this uh, adult beverage category mm -hmm. it's really enabled smaller brands to do more with to do more with more going d to c um and then of course in the uh, non-alc world you know obviously obviously the, the big takeaway in learning is you know uh in d to c getting covid is really upsizing your formats making sure you have a lot of variety and opportunity to upsize different sorts of um innovation into larger formats that's the that's the huge takeaway there yeah well this was the quickest hour that i can i can remember for a long time at least at least for me hopefully for everybody else but i want to have um everyone here on the panel first thank everybody but you know give everybody a little uh, just a chance for some parting thoughts before we go into the the smaller group networking um groups so just so everyone remembers we are going to have two kind of mini networking networking sessions of about 12 minutes uh, each. And we will kind of, the, the, the controller person here, which is not me, will bring everybody back after the first session. And then we'll kind of break into a second group. But um, Greg, let me start with you. And, and again, thank you so much to the Anshin uh, team because you guys did all the work to bring this together. 
Um, but you know, any parting thoughts, best practices, what what you know, what's changed, what you know, thoughts, you know, advice, anything. Well, well, thanks, thanks for the the kind words and the thanks. Thank you to my team. It's amazing what it takes to to do these things, even virtually. <laughs> I know you <laughs> it's, called it's, and said let's do it, and I was like, uh, can you organize it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oops. See, it was my, I, I said it first and then I had to own yeah, it. That's <laughs> the truth. I'm like, I ain't doing it. Yeah, I get it. It's fair. It's fair. Um, I mean, parting, parting words. I mean, there's so much, I, I would say, you know, we thought, we hoped back in the spring that there'd be, when we look back on 2020, there'd be a pre COVID COVID and post COVID period. Right. And, and now it doesn't look like, we're truly going to get to a post COVID period anytime soon. Um, so we just have to accept it as part of the new normal. And that means we have to adjust our, our cadence and our expectations and our financial models and projections to allow for that kind of uncertainty. You know, you just, you just don't know for sure. So, you know, the whole, the whole uh, exercise is healthy, you know, to, to reexamine your business. We always advise our clients, to update their projections at least quarterly. I would say now you could do it weekly and it still wouldn't be enough. Um, you can never know your numbers well enough. You can never be on top of your business enough during times like this. Um, and, and the best advice I can give is to just be prepared because you just don't know what that next phone call or that next uh, video chat is gonna bring. Yeah, if you've got that black ink, try to keep it. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely. Um, Josh, why don't I go to you here? I would just say take the time now to connect with as many, you know, supporters, advisors, collaborators, founders as you possibly can. People are home. They're available. I mean, they're 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 on their sofa, they're they might they're working remotely. They have more time. I have spent more time talking to founders and thought leaders than I ever have in my career because I'm not stuck on a plane. I'm not going to fancy lunches, I'm not going to dinners. I'm not going to cocktail parties, although I love cocktailing at home. I mean, like the amount of time to connect with people that you actually really want to learn from, um, you got to do it because you're not doing it in the real world. And people are truly available. So I would say there's a silver lining. And the silver lining is we can connect digitally. We can connect virtually. And people will give you the time. We all get Zoom fatigue a little bit. But even if it's over the phone, I really, I, I really feel strongly that relationship currency now matters more than ever and you have the ability to create that and to put incredible people around you i'm not talking just employees i'm talking about thought leaders who build amazing brands who can help you think through challenges um so anyway that's yeah. that that's what i feel a lot of people are experiencing and it's really powerful no it's well said um bill moses any any parting thoughts and thank oh, you yeah, i think i think the uh what's really up for me that I think is important for smaller companies or medium sized companies that are growing fast is really take the time to make sure uh, your work environment's safe. I think that's, uh, uh, that's my takeaway. Yep. Nick Gianuzzi. Yeah. I mean, I guess COVID like a lot of things in life, there's sort of the haves and the have nots. And for those of you who are out there slogging hard and trying to, grow your business and COVID, you know, hit you with that left hook, what I can tell you is that uh, the reason for your brand and the success of your brand that was there before is still there. You just might be getting hit by, you know, the wrong set of factors. Again, if you're in the bar category or whatever it is, and you just have to kind of put your head down and remember what entrepreneurs do and they, they fight through the bad times. And, you know, I always tell my clients and my my coworkers and my kids, there's going to be a rainy day and you got to survive the rainy day. And nobody ever actually believes the rainy day is going to happen, but you know what? It just happened. So remember that, that, that the basics of what we do and what we provide to the public is, is good and, and sought after. And there is money somewhere there and there's an acquire somewhere there. And you just got to stick to it. And for those of you who've been on the other side of that and been fortunate enough to get a lift from this, take advantage of lift. Maybe it is the time to sell your company right now. You know, maybe you've got that crazy halo right now and you can, you can sell your company a little bit earlier, or maybe you can go out and do a big financing when nobody else can, because you know, you're super shiny right now, you know, shiny doesn't last and good days don't always last. So 
you know, don't, don't be afraid. And if you're, if you're making more money than you thought, well, focus on how to deploy that to keep the acceleration that you're experiencing. Um, and, you know, just shuck and jive uh, based on your, your set of circumstances. No, nope, well said too. Last, Nick McCoy, my great business partner, Harry Whipstitch. Um, thanks, Mike. And uh, thanks for being a great business partner too. Um, I guess the last thing I'd say is, look, I, I, miss, uh, I miss all the in-person events, just like everybody else. Um, you know, I'm usually on the road 45, 50 nights a year, and you know, it's a blast. We all get together. But you know, what I've seen here is that this industry continues to thrive on, on Zoom. I mean, this industry is, is just a really strong community, and um, it's, it's prevailing and thriving with Zoom. It's not an impediment to raising money. It's not an impediment to due diligence on deals. People are doing, you know, virtual plant tours and all these things are working right now. And so as I look ahead, you know, there's going to be a time when we're all back together again in person. And I think that's great. And you know, there's a part of me that hopes that not only that, but it's also balanced with, you know, the fact that we can connect with so many more people so much more frequently with Zoom than if we have to fly around the country every week to connect in person. So I think embracing this change and you know, kind of making lemon with lemonade is what we're doing and continuing to do that. You know, we're all gonna be better together. Yeah, I agree.